kind of open. I had high hopes. I slept with Jimmy Graham and Dustin Fantastic. Late in the second quarter. Gene, you might have them open up that back door. You got another six people walked in. There's seats for them, that's fine. Oh man, I, I, I didn't know. That was funny, I mean, you make some notation. Well, it, it was, I thought it was funny. That guy looked like he was struggling to talk, man. Oh, really? Funny. I thought he did. Just so, right to peak. Because all, all oh, the no, stages. Okay, I wondered about that. What color would you have? I don't even want to know. They're a commentator and judge all the different colors. in the flag salute this morning? Absolutely. Glad to. Thank you. This is the exhibit. Okay. Cool. This is a, these are the slides. So you can see uh, that's last Friday. That's us. Sent it out to everybody else. These were in Word comment boxes, but they don't work very well. We need to get our clock updates a little bit fast, so we wait till it's the actual time. But you can keep chatting for a few more minutes. <laughs> Got a couple minutes yet. While we're waiting, I just wanted to say I think that the pink award today will be going to Sheriff Boudreaux. I didn't know they made colors like that for men. I really didn't. <laughs> Enough. If you please, uh, thank you for coming to our regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If you please stand, join us in our flag salute led this morning by Supervisor Vanderpool and remain standing for a moment of silence. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Please be seated. First item this morning is our Board of Supervisors matters. I will turn to Supervisor Vanderpool. Well, first of all, just to continue the uh, the pink comments, you really see uh, it's nice to see county employees supporting the uh, 
uh, wear pink day, uh, National Pink Day today, or County Pink Day. Uh, you see everything in the spectrum from Boudreaux on one end, and then on the other end of the elected spectrum, you're wearing pink, Roland, so I'm not going to call you out. But we have a DA not wearing any kind of pink, so um, we, we've definitely got the whole gamut here today. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for supporting uh, awareness uh, for breast cancer. A um, few things I wanted to uh, go over uh, today. Um, actually, this week um, we've got, I believe it's on... Uh, I think it's tomorrow. Um, we have an event that's being put on by our fire department um, called uh, Fire Ops 101. Uh, oh, it is canceled? Oh, okay. Canceled, never mind. I, I'm not going to cover that event. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate you letting me know in front before I said that. Um, <laughs> I didn't know there was a sign-up. I was going to show up and support it. Um, and then... Uh, um, Southern California Edison is celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month uh, with an event this Friday at the Tulare Edison Ag Tech Center. Um, hopefully that will be very well attended and thanks Southern California Edison for doing that. Um, and then uh, this Saturday there's a very large event in, in Tulare and that's the Relay for Life. Uh, they do a fantastic job every year and raise a lot of money uh, for uh, cancer awareness and uh, fighting cancer. And so the t community of Tulare really shows up and supports that event. And uh, I will be speaking and helping with the registration so that I can continue to stay ahead of Supervisor Cox's volunteer hours. Um, and then actually, uh, on another note, before I go into some more subject matter that I wanted to cover today, uh, this was a very tough weekend for me uh, because I'm a UCLA fan. Um, UCLA lost a very tough game. And so I was a little downtrodden until I saw in the newspaper a local score that made me feel a little bit better. Um, on Friday night, uh, Tulare Union had the opportunity of playing Dinuba, um, and that made me feel a lot better. Uh, Tulare Union <laughs> won 35-19 to against Dinuba, so uh, that, that made me feel good about uh, football again. So uh, I'm sure glad Dinuba exists, Supervisor Worthy. <laughs> um, and then the last thing, uh, or one of the last things, because Supervisor Woodley is very critical of me saying the last thing, um, another thing I wanted to go over really is, is I want to make a request to um, our, uh, probably the CAO's office that's going to be bringing this forward. I went to a conference last week for the San Joaquin Valley Association of California Counties, um, and RCRC had a presentation at that event. And really had some very good uh, specifics about uh, the, the marijuana legislation that's going to be or has been signed into law. Um, and really, I think that there's uh, a need to uh, act very quickly uh, because of uh, some of the timelines of uh, this legislation. Um, and if we don't act quickly, so some of our uh, enforcement can only happen through ordinance. Uh, and ordinance, ordinances do take a while for adoption. Um, but one specific uh, example is related to the transportation of marijuana. If, if there's an outright ban, that's one option. Um, there, there are several options to consider, but uh, related to the transportation of marijuana within the county, um, that needs to be handled by January 1, 2016. Um, and so for us to meet the, the time frames of our ordinances, uh, we need to make sure that we're on top of that. So I'd like the CAO's office to bring forward um, some options uh, for that uh, so that we can make sure we are uh, ahead of the game when that is implemented. Um, and then the last thing I will say is this is uh, Gene, our CAO's last uh, meeting, and uh, I sure appreciate the great job you've done, Gene, as CAO here in Tulare County. I think we're in a great position, and uh, I will save all of my words for your, your farewell luncheon or whatever we're going to end up doing for you, but uh, I really appreciate all your hard work, so thank you very much. That's all I get. Okay, uh, last Friday uh, I was able to give a pre presentation to uh, the Visalia Breakfast Lions. Um, that went very well. We talked to them about the step up programming and county finances. Uh, yesterday attended the ribbon cutting of the Cartmill Interchange in Tulare. Uh, that was, a, a, I think they finished that job in lightning speed, even considering that they had some hiccups in the beginning with estimates and stuff. Uh, they have really knocked out a beautiful project there in the city of Tulare, which, you know, I don't drive that much, but I understand Supervisor Vanderpool was inconvenienced by at least three minutes a day. And we were glad that that was fixed. 
Um, today, I am too. <laughs> uh, today, Allison Pierce, myself, will be at the City of Isaiah's Gang Task Force meeting. We'll make a presentation on the event that was done a couple weeks ago at Cafe 210. Uh, tomorrow is the open house for the Visalia Emergency Aid Council from 4 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, tonight is a taste of downtown uh, Visalia. I am happy to announce that my wife Connie is six and a half years cancer free. I will share this other side of this ribbon. Whoever gave these to us, thank you. I will share the other side of this with uh, my wife. And I think I kind of saved the best for last uh, going into the uh, volunteering for that we're supposed to be keeping track of here as county employees. Uh, I was uh, pretty excited last week, received the opportunity to volunteer at a special event. All we were told is that this would be a fun detail, but they needed people desperately to uh, attend from the, the city of Isalia uh, volunteer police department. So my wife and I, you know, changed a couple things in our schedule, and we agreed to do that. They needed someone to drive the uh, command bus. I'm one of the volunteers that does that, and so I, I got to drive the command bus for that event. So we showed up at 5 o'clock in the morning last Thursday, and uh, really all we were told, this is going to be a fun detail. Well, everyone had fun except 52 people. And those 52 people did not have any fun at all. And there were some before and I guess many after. We're up to 90 now. Uh, but we got to participate in Project Red Soul. Uh, the command bus that I drove over became the uh, evidence department where evidence was dropped off. And it didn't take long for that beautiful multi-million dollar clean bus to turn into a skunk farm. Uh, one officer stuck his head in and said, uh, can we drop off marijuana here? We have, you know, a little bit of marijuana that we took off of these places. And we have clippings. And we said, sure, you know, you can drop that off here. Well, a little bit of marijuana to them was 30 pounds. And they dropped off, you know, two big bags of, of marijuana that had to be secured. So it went to the back of the bus. Um, but that was quite an event to see the several hundred officers there from the many, many agencies that participated. I think our, our sheriff, the city police departments that were involved, the other county, uh, de other counties departments that came over. I saw Kern, San Luis Obispo. I saw there were folks there from Madera County all over the sheriff's got a better count than I do. But the room was packed full of officers ready to go. 7 a.m. Uh, at, you know, on the dot those officers hit I don't know how many locations at one time but it was a lot and after about an hour and a half or so they started bringing prisoners back in so that was pretty exciting to see an operation like that pulled off and kudos goes out to our sheriff his command staff the team so whatever team put that together and I know it wasn't just your team sheriff but kudos to you you did a wonderful job and I think our streets throughout the county are safer today because of that project. And it wasn't just one area, it was county wide. So thank you and, and good job. Now I know why you had the munchies on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Ashita. Last uh, Saturday, Supervisor Annis and I attended the Sierra View Hospital Gala, which was well attended, it was a great event. Uh, I had the chance to be the judge for the dance contest, and my team ended up second. Uh, it, we had a great time. <clears throat> Yesterday, coming down Highway 137, <clears throat> I saw the sheriff's armored vehicle uh, headed west, and I can say that it moves a lot faster than the last armored vehicle that we had. This morning, coming to work, I noticed that the, the, they are um, fixing the road on Highway 65 from, from Lindsay, uh, probably about a mile to a mile south, and that was the road that was the part that was kind of eroding away. So it looks like they were grinding the, uh, the road, so we'll have that fixed. It'll be a small part of Highway 65 that's fixed, but um, 
<clears throat> it was deteriorating really fast. Many years ago, in my terms, that uh, I approached our CAO, Gene Rousseau, and asked him to come back to Tulare County as our CAO. And I'm very glad that uh, I approached Gene and with the support of the board and our vice chair person, Connie Conway, we hired Gene Rousseau as our county administrative officer. Gene's had a stellar uh, performance record here. You can tell by where we sit as a county. Uh, financially, we are probably one of the best positioned counties in the state of California. And I want to thank Gene publicly in front of our audience today for the years of service he's given us. And not only the years of service, but the expertise that he's led us to put us in this position. I think Gene moving to Fresno County, which is probably the largest county in the valley, uh, is a testament to his ability. And our, we also have a theory in Tulare County that <coughs> We know you may not stay with us forever, but we want you to be in a position that someone else wants you. And that's exactly what's happened with Gene. Gene's proven himself, and uh, congratulations, Gene, and, and uh, I'm sure you're gonna have a bright future in Fresno County. Thank you. Supervisor Ennis is not able to be with us this morning. He's uh, recovering from a minor uh, um, incident, but uh, we wish him well, and he'll be back with us, I'm sure, next week. Um, I just wanted to point out that last yesterday we had a joint meeting with the Thule Indian Tribe. Um, very good meeting, I think. We're trying to do these on an annual basis just to uh, maintain good uh, working relationship with the tribe. And uh, one of the things that, that was reported out to us yesterday is that they are actively seeking uh, to move their casino down to uh, within the city limits of Porterville. And so, uh, you know, it's good to have that kind of a conversation, know about it in advance, and there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done um, between the tribe and the county. When we look at off-reservation uh, casinos, there are issues in terms of impacts to the county uh, services, service levels. And so we'll be negotiating with the tribe over those issues. They'll have many others to deal with at the governor's office and, and federal government perhaps as well. Um, I did it also the Cartmill Interchange uh, opening yesterday, and that was a great, great event. Beautiful facility, uh, looks really good. And uh, we're happy that it came in uh, on time and, and on budget, essentially, after some, uh, as Phil said, some, some minor hiccups along the way. Uh, my, uh, my colleagues have stolen some of my thunder about uh, Gene Rousseau, uh, but uh, I would like to say more than just ditto. You know, Gene has been, uh, uh, a stalwart in terms of um, a CAO for Tulare County. Um, I've been on the board for 17 years. I think his tenure is the longest of anyone that I've, I've had since, uh, since I've been here, and that's a testament to his capabilities. Uh, Gene has pointed out that uh, since, he, since, he had, since he had been here, nearly every department head had changed. I think there's only one that's outlasted him, County Council. <laughs> <laughs> just goes to show you can't kill an attorney. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> just kidding. E even, uh, though it, even though at times you'd like to. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do wish Gene well. I think, you know, it's, it, this is a signature position for anyone, uh, certainly in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, Fresno County is not only the largest county uh, population-wise, it's about double uh, the, the size of government uh, from Tulare County. Uh, it's, it's moving home for Gene. He won't be having to commute those 70 plus miles a day or whatever it was that he routinely had to drive down here and back. And, um, you know, we wish him well. I told him, I said, the good thing about Fresno County is you didn't create their problems, you're just inheriting them. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, I, you know, he'll have a He'll have a fresh opportunity to bring his good work to Fresno County, and, and we know that that's going to be to the benefit of Fresno County. And we thank him for all the, the good work that he's done here in, in Tulare County. So, Gene, congratulations to you, and we wish you well. And just a comment on these, these, these two pins. I'm glad to know that they're separate pins, and you give one away, because I thought at first they were earrings. <laughs> I mean, I'll do some things for 
the pink, but that would be going a bit far for me, I think. So um, with that, we will close public comment period and we'll bring it back to the board now. And I have a proclamation to present recognizing October 4th through the 10th as National 4-H Week. And uh, I understand we have some folks here who are ambassadors that are going to come forward and I'd like to present this proclamation to them. Ordinarily, this would be something I would defer to Supervisor Ennis because he is our 4-H uh, uh, guru. He's been actively engaged with 4-H for many, many years. In his absence, I'm happy to be able to do this. So, whereas 4-H is a community of young people ages 5 through 19 cr across America who are learning leadership, c citizenship, and life skills. And whereas 4-H is one of the largest youth organizations in California, located in every county in the state, serving youth in urban, suburban, and rural settings. And whereas 4-H is funded by federal, state, and local governments, as well as through corporate foundation and individual gifts, and whereas 4-H has been helping youth and adults learn, grow, and work together for over 100 years in California, and whereas 4-H in Tulare County engages more than 800 youth and over 250 adult volunteers in 15 local clubs, and whereas October 4th 10th, through the 10th, 2015, has been selected as National 4-H Week, now therefore be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim October 4th through the 10th, 2015, is National 4-H Week in Tulare County, dated this date, October 6th, assigned by Alan Ishida, Pete Vanderpool, Phil Cox, Steve Worthley, and Mike Ennis. Congratulations to you guys. Thank you. You want to say a few words? Yes, please. Okay. You can either stay here or... Good morning, my name is Elizabeth Verberg. I am 17 years, years old and I go to, I'm a senior at El Diamante High School. I've been in 4-H in for nine years. I am currently the vice president of Elbow Creek 4-H Club, a member of the Tulare County High 4-H Club and a Tulare County All-Star Ambassador and currently the 2015-2016 California 4-H Discussion Meet Youth Co-Chair. Hello, my name is Brianna Dempsey. I'm 17 years old and I also attend El Monte High School where I'm a senior. I've been in 4-H for six years. I am currently the president of my 4-H club, which is Liberty 4-H. I'm the vice president of Tulare County High 4-H, team leader for rabbits, sign language, and public speaking. More than six million youth across the, across the country today will celebrate National 4-H Week. And this year's theme is 4-H Grows Here. And the annual celebration of 4-H is, is during the first week, first full week of October. During National 4-H Week, 4-H will showcase the great things that 4-H offers young people and the highlights that the incredible 4-H youth in the community who work hard each day to make a positive impact on the community. For 2015, National 4-H Week starts on October 4th and ends on, Sunday, on Saturday, October 10th. Clubs throughout Tulare County have window displays around the, around the county to let the public know about 4-H and a little information about the different projects we offer. On October 7th, at the Corporation Extension Tulare County office in Tulare, we will be having a National 4-H Youth Science Day and the theme is Motion to Commotion. Tractor Supply Company is a proud sponsor of National 4-H. In the spring and fall, Tractor Supply will have a clover drive. By donating a dollar, you will be helping change 4-H. 70% will go back to local clubs, 10% will go to state, and 20% will go to National 4-H. In the spring, Tulare County brought in $2,100 California came in fourth place with $51,809, and nationally we raised over $1.5 million. We appreciate, we appreciate the support the Board of Supervisors has, have given us in support of the program. The County Record Book Award winners send their thank yous for the certificates you provided last month. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning, ladies, and well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Now is the time for public comments. Anyone wishing to address the board this morning on items which are within our jurisdiction but not on today's agenda are invited to do so. Yes, County Council. I, I, if I may, sir, since um, uh, this is the last opportunity, I'll have to make public comment regarding Mr. Russo. Um, I did ask him if he would not mind staying here until I retired. And he has not managed to do that, but he has managed to be here for quite some time. It is really critical for county councils and CAOs to work closely together. When they do that, the county benefits. Uh, the county family benefits and the county's citizens benefit. Um, I think, if I've done the math right, that since I came here in 1981, Mr. Rousseau is the tenth CAO that I work with. I am now in double digits with CAOs. And um, to contrast that, the county council's office for Tulare was created in 1946, and since that time we have had five county councils, including me. So um, a little volatility in the CAO's office. Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, Mr. Rousseau is the CAO I've worked with the longest, and I can say without question the CAO who's been most open to working collaboratively, and uh, I think we've had, been a good team, and I would really like to thank him for all of the efforts uh, that he's given toward my office specifically and then toward the county generally. I wish him well in his new assignment, Fresno, uh, Fresno's uh, Game is our loss, I guess. Uh, but um, he was right next door. We know where to get him if we need him. Thank you. Are there others that wish to make public comments at this time? Good morning. Good you give morning, us your name and address, please. Certainly. Jesse Snyder, Self Help Enterprises. Just wanted to take a moment this morning to thank the county. Um, including the county administrative officer, uh, for the opportunity to be a partner with the county in your drought relief efforts. Um, we really appreciate the confidence that that shows in our organization, as well as United Way and CSET, the other partners in the effort. Um, with, along with those partners, uh, over or about 400 interim solution water tanks have been installed in the county so far, so we're feeling really good about that. And uh, we've just about finished up with Households that are currently eligible, which is owner-occupied households, and we're looking forward to the next step and hoping the county will find a way forward to offer some level of assistance to renter-occupied homes um, that currently do not qualify for the interim solution. Thank you very much. Jesse, thank you for being here, and, and we not only rely, uh, trust you and rely upon you, but we are beholding to you. Uh, thank we you, thank Supervisor. you very much for your expertise and your, and your help in dealing with this crisis in Tulare County. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other public comments at this time? All right, we will close the public comment period and <clears throat> bring it back for our consent calendar. We are going to move uh, the addendum items one and two from the consent calendar and take them up as separate items. Are there any other items members wish to handle separately or call attention to on the consent calendar? Uh, this chair motion to approve the set items four through 18. Second. We have a motion by Supervisor Cox, second by Supervisor Rashida, please cast your votes. Votes are unanimous, 4-0. Supervisor Ennis being absent. All right, this time we will take up our untimed items. Uh, item number 19 is a request from the County Administrative Office to approve the Innovative Readiness Training Application Request for Military Assistance to Drill New Wells to replace those that have failed. Good morning, Mrs. England. Good morning, Denise England, County Administrative Office. Um, the item before you is an application for the Innovative Readiness Training Program. Um, requesting military assistance uh, to uh, address the dry wells throughout the county. Um, this program was brought to our attention by Assemblyman Mathis, um, and also um, Congressman McCarthy has also uh, talked with us about, about this program. Um, and this program provides real-world real world training opportunities for military service uh, members and units to prepare for their wartime activities by, and supporting um, underserved communities. And so um, this is the first step to ask for that um, assistance, and then um, we would be followed up with by the Department of Defense. Um, the application does require that the county um, sign a, a hold harmless agreement, which is um, a deviation from typical county protocol. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions by members? 
Uh, they, Denise, they just, uh, is there any example of um, this being used in other jurisdictions, at least in the United States? Um, not, ne not necessarily with the wells. There's other programs, okay. um, medical relief and some other things that have been done in other jurisdictions. Okay, so it has happened, just not specific. And I know that this applies to uh, the broad range of skills and uh, trainings that uh, our military members do have. So uh, it is very possible that this could work um, and, and could really alleviate some of the uh, dry well issues we're having in the county. Correct. Well, I, I just want to say, too, that in the event that this did uh, work its way through the process and, and come to fruition, uh, it would have be very valuable benefit to our county because they're talking yeah. about doing a number of wells. And it's not only just drilling the wells, but they also, you know, bring material and supplies. So it's not like they show up and say, where's your, here's our equipment, where's your, where's your piping and everything. They right. bring all that with them. So there is the potential to provide some infrastructural benefits to our, to our county as well. Okay, at this point, any further discussion, comments, entertain a motion? A yeah, motion to approve. I'll second that motion, and let's hope that it works. Motion by uh, Supervisor Cox, and by Supervisor Vanderpool. Please cast your votes. Votes are for nothing unanimously. Supervisor Ennis being absent. And then we'll take up the uh, adoption of a resolution proclaiming, this is item number one of our addendum, uh, proclaiming the existence of a local emergency due to widespread increasing tree mortality in Tulare County direct department to return every 30 days to confirm the ongoing need for local emergency declaration. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Vaughn. Debbie Vaughn, County Administrative Office. Um, the item before you uh, came originally across as a request from other counties to support their efforts, um, specifically Madera, Mariposa, Fresno, and Tuolumne County have all declared local emergencies due to the extreme conditions of tree mortality in the forest. Um, so. Uh, this item was sort of a last minute item. It was put on the agenda for your board's consideration. Um, it is on here as declaring a local emergency um, as one of the options, but you'll note that there's also, um, or there is also the option that you can take another course of action. And the reason I say that, and I'll defer after I give you background to Andrew Lockman, is that um, in Tulare County's particular case, we may not have the conditions um, technically that warrant a local emergency, but again, I'll let Andrew speak to that. So the background on this is that, as your board knows, you have taken an active interest um, all year in the tree mortality. You've addressed it with legislators, agencies at both the state and the federal level. Um, the, the tree mortality continues to accelerate. Um, it's anticipated to um, exponentially grow by next year because it takes some time for the impacts to show um, the, the increase in tree mortality. So um, uh, some of our Congressman uh, Nunes, Congressman Nunes, Congressman McCarthy, and Congressman Baladeo have sent letters of request to the Forest Service asking that areas within um, our forest, within Tulare County, be designated under the USDA's Insect and Disease Act um, that act allows for um, accelerated fuels reduction um, due to tree mortality caused by insect or disease, which is the cause um, in addition to the drought. The drought is the first impact, and then it makes the trees susceptible success to insect and disease, and that's what we're experiencing. So um, the USDA has responded, um, that, and the Forest Service has responded to those congressmen saying that they are looking into additional designations. Um, they have also sent that feedback to the California National Resource Agency. At this point, we do not specifically have the information on which areas they're um, intending to designate or asking to be designated, but they have told us that um, the majority of our forest lands are in there. However, that would just be a first step. Um, the missing component to that is obviously the resources, um, which is the Forest Service's existing issue anyway, um, to some degree, in addition to environmental concerns um, in addressing this tree mortality. So the, um, the item before you again is to declare a local emergency, and I'm gonna let Andrew speak now to uh, the technical aspects of that. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisors, um, soon to be departing CAO and Council. Um, thank you this morning. I'm really here to provide any um, technical assistance to the board that I can offer on this topic. Um, 
In speaking with Cal OES, the State Office of Emergency Services, and they expressed numerous concerns which were um, in line with my own concerns. I, I sought the external validation just to make sure that I wasn't um, off the, off the uh, deep end here. Um, some of the concerns that were raised with um, proclaiming a local emergency here is um, the first and foremost that we don't have the, the jurisdiction or the, the legal um, authority or responsibility to take the actions that we're proposing to be taken within the, the forest. Um, typically that's the first thing that you're looking for in local proclamation is that you have the responsibility to take the action. Um, it's also worth noting that Mariposa and Tuolumne counties in particular do have um, a numerous um, areas of tree mortality within their local and state responsibility area that they are taking actions um, and the state is considering providing them funding. Um, in order for this to rise to a FEMA level of disaster, again, as we talked about, I think a few weeks ago, you'd have to have 60 something million dollars for the state of California public agency losses. Um, and that's going to be very difficult to articulate if we don't have response actions. Um, the last, the last piece is looking at the, the condition of extreme peril. Um, we, we've had some philosophical debate about this, whether or not the, the trees being dead in and of themselves is the extreme peril or the event that may result from that, whether it's a wildfire or a, windstorm knocking them down or whatnot would, would normally be defined as the extreme peril. So th those were the concerns that were raised. Um, happy to answer any questions that the board may have um, and here to advise however I can. Andrew, I noticed that you had sent us an email um, listing, you know, Appendix C, determining if a local emergency should be declared. And the very first item on them is hazard endangers or has the potential to endanger the lives and or property of the community. Two thirds of Tulare County is in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Koi National Forest has got one of the worst mortality situations on the national forest. We just have gone through a, the rough fire, which burned 151,000 acres, most in Fresno County, some of it in Tulare County, but the potential is there to do so much more than that. You know, and, and I feel like we need to um, support our, our sister counties with this declaration, and I don't really see any downside. I mean, is somebody going to sue us or seek an estoppel or something of our declaring a declaration? Uh, of an emergency for this because and this is one of the problems I find if you have a hurricane if you have a wildfire if you have a flood you have an incident and everybody says oh that's an emergency but we have an emergency up there it's these dead and dying trees that all it takes is an ignition and all of a sudden we're going to have a half a million acre fire or a million acre fire that to me should be treated like an emergency and and the fact that our laws seem to be a little bit reticent about how to address that particular issue, uh, it, to me, it needs to be rectified. I mean, we need the government to act like this is the emergency that it truly is. And so I, I fully support this, this uh, position. And uh, I don't know how most of my, my board members feel, but I, I feel like we should pursue this. Supervisor Cox. If I can, I, I've struggled with this because it seems like every time we've gone back to D.C. or met with the, the forestry, forestry department there, we've, we've been bringing this up. They're mismanagement of their lands. So I, I tried to put this in, in something that would be easier for me and others to understand. And, I, and I've used this analogy before. It's like having a 40-year-old roof on your house. And every year, you, you patch the leaks. You see a little leak, you go patch it. And you patch it for years. And, and for decades, you might be patching these, links, uh, these leaks. And all of a sudden, a big leak springs up that a patch won't fix, and so we're going to declare this 40-year-old roof an emergency. I mean, I just have a, a problem with that because we've known for decades that this is an issue, and and realistically, this is not our issue. We cannot fix this. The federal government has got to fix this. So we need to have our federal elected officials fix this. So I, I mean, I have, I don't really support this from our level because I don't think we have jurisdiction. If we had jurisdiction, I would be right beside you, right behind you, however you want me to stand. But in this case here, we, we don't have the jurisdiction. And this is, you know, in my opinion, it's been, you know, although it may be an emergency in some people's eyes, it's been building for decades and our federal government needs to take care of it. Well, I, 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 I can appreciate that comment, but I would say is that we well, don't have jurisdiction over the, over the Forest Service or the BLM or the National Park lands, but we have private inholdings. We have private lands that are right adjacent to these. We, had, we just had this discussion yesterday with the, with the Thule Indian tribe. They've been working for years to manage their forest. It's the lack of management of the Sequoia National Forest that surrounds them, which is the problem. 
because what's the benefit of, of doing your work on your side of the line if on the other side of the line you have a, a, a conflagration getting ready to just attack you? And that's, that's the emergency. The emergency is if they don't take action to protect their lands, it's going to have that direct impact on our, on our properties adjacent to that. So, again, I think this is truly an emergency. Somehow we've got to get, we have got to get them to do something. They, they just seem to ignore us. We, you know, we go back and other counties go back, and this is, this is something that's got to be addressed. And I just feel like this is one of the ways of trying to do that. Supervisor Vanderpool. Uh, I, I just had a question. Maybe it's uh, for Debbie. Um, in terms of getting the uh, USDA designation um, in the uh, forest, would would having a having proclaimed a local emergency assist in obtaining that declaration that we need to get in order to expedite fuel reduction? Well, I would love to tell you that I have the entire Insect and D Disease Act <laughs> regulation memorized, but I do not. Okay. Um, but. From the parts that I do recall, I don't know how that could be it doesn't correlate. A, of a benefit. Okay. You know, there's, I think, though, separately from Andrew's um, concerns, um, which um, I think, Andrew, we're supposed to meet two of those criteria, right? Not one on that list? Um, one is maybe two, which probably three is definitely. Okay. So um, separate from that, um, there is the the benefit of having more public awareness of the issue. Um, your board recognized this, you know, last year, and it's been addressing it. But the public, I think, is just now recognizing that it's a significant issue. So there's the technical benefit, and then there's, you know, some kind of intangible, maybe, or I don't even know if that's intangible. There's a real benefit of having generating awareness on it. Yeah, and I totally agree about the awareness piece. And then, um, you know, we look at uh, what our air quality looked like during the, the rough fire, which was only a, a portion in Tulare County. Um, and, you know, you wait to proclaim an emergency until everybody's inhaling it and uh, it could potentially cause health problems down the line. Um, and we know what the cause of it is, and it's the fact that there is a lack of management. Um, and you said earlier in your, in your presentation um, that the, the deaths of these trees that have been affected by the drought may not be seen this year. It could be next. Um, I think this is really being uh, proactive, but is it truly acknowledging the emergency that does exist today that we just may not be able to see right now. Um, and when it does uh, burn, uh, if it does uh, happen, and hopefully it does not, um, we have a catastrophic emergency that we're then trying to deal with um, on the reactive side rather than being proactive. And so I think this is a very good thing. I think it's a proactive declaration of an emergency that does exist. Um, it just may not be having the, the impacts that are so visible right now. Pleasure. Shoot it. Government, <clears throat> government is generally reactive. <clears throat> and that's why we don't fit under the, the, the category that Andrew brought up. But I can say one thing that we've, we've experienced during the rough fire, this is a real health hazard. It's not just a fire hazard in the forest, but if you were, drove through Fresno during the top, uh, the peak of the rough fire, it looked like fog. And then I live next to the foothills and east of Lindsay, and I couldn't see the foothills. So over 60% of the PM 2.5 come from come from forest fires. They don't come from automobiles. It comes from forest fires. And we need to proactively manage a catastrophic, well, potential catastrophic event. These forest fires are the new norm. We're going to have them every year. And the magnitude we had this year will be repeated next year and the year following because we have not managed the forest. The state of California, the governor's office, should be sitting in Washington, D.C., pounding on the desk and saying, we need to take care of this problem. And I think a lot of this is directed to the state of California, saying the valley counties and the mountain counties are really concerned with this. Do something about it. And the governor and our legislature do have influence in Washington, D.C., which we haven't seen being used to the extent it should be on the management of the forest and the catastrophic fires we've had. So I wholeheartedly support uh, this, this request because unless 
we get, get together as counties and increase our clout, uh, they're not going to pay attention to us one at a time. So I, I would totally support this uh, initiative. Anyone here wishing to address this matter from the public? Mr. Cooney? Three minutes, Manuel. And please give us, your, give us your name and address. Yeah, Manuel Cooney, President of Nisei Farmers League in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we'll be talking. Congratulations. Uh, we look forward to working with an experienced again CAO. So great. Um, yeah, this issue has become, and I agree with uh, Alan 100% and Steve and uh, Vanderpool, absolutely right. And Mr. Cox, I understand your issue, but this is not what it is. This country is, and this state has to fight for itself in its own counties, especially the San Joaquin Valley. The air quality was a real problem. As Steve Worthley serves on as your representative from this county, I mean, they don't even, EPA doesn't consider that burns of these things air quality issues. Well, my God, we have to tell businesses, but you got to cut more, but we don't worry about the fires. You know, we're going to add that to your inventory and your problems, but you need to cut. Well, wait a minute. But again, you look what happened at Napa, Sonoma. That is a disaster of over 1,800 homes destroyed and burned, people's lives. Now to deal with trying to get those homes, it's going to be like New Orleans. Still people living in trailers. So I think the concept of you getting involved, yeah, there may not be statute that allows you to do things, but if you don't put your foot in the door and we take care of this valley, we're not going to get it to happen. And you're right. The governor should have been jumping on this, and, and with uh, Secretary of Agriculture should have been out here. Bill Sachs should have been out here to deal with this issue because of the disease problem and how the regulation set forth upon the USDA. So we support this tremendously. And I know our farmers do in our community in this entire valley wants what you're doing with all the other counties to work together and, and do what you have to do to protect ourselves. So thank you. What else? Mr. Chair, I, I will I'll support my board in this, in this effort um, because I think uh, collaborating with the other counties, with the other agencies, we need to hold the federal government's feet to the fire, so to speak. <laughs> no. Um, no they, they need to take care of this. We cannot take care of this. They need to take care of this. And I think the only way we're going to get them to pay attention is if we do group together and, and show, uh, you know, show unity and, and uh, size. So I, I'll support my board in this. I still don't think it's an emergency just because they've not known about this for decades, but I will support the board. I'll entertain a motion. So move. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Ishida, seconded by Super Vanderpool. Please cast your votes. Votes are unanimous. Thanks for calling me Super again. Appreciate that. Uh, four to nothing. Uh, unanimous absent uh, Supervisor Ennis's absence. All right. That will take us to item number two for our addendum, which is taking action on the following options to decline to take action and provide direction to staff on any alternative and this has to do with our JPA that we're trying to create in order to uh, be able to access uh, funding from the water bond passed by the voters of, of the state of California. And uh, we'll let um, Ms. England explain further. Good morning again. Denise England, County Administrative Office. Um, and so the board passed um, back in on July 21st a resolution that supported a JPA to be formed um, at that time between Tulare, Fresno, Kings, um, Merced, and uh, Kern Counties. Kern County has since um, withdrawn. They, they um, have not moved forward with the JPA. Um, but on September 12th, um, there was a meeting in Fresno of the remaining counties, and um, the JPA agreement at that time was amended to include, a, went from a five board, a five member board to a nine member board. Um, since then, um, it's grown to an 11 member board, adding um, representative cities from both uh, the Eastern Valley interest and the Western Valley interest and irrigation districts also reflecting the same geographical interest. Um, I believe council has provided a red line. Yes. Yes, we, we have provided a red line example, uh, Mr. Chairman, and we also have a PowerPoint presentation if that would be of assistance to your board. What you have in front of you is <laughs> Uh, the black printing is the um, agreement which was actually adopted by the County of Fresno. 
The red printing are the changes that were suggested by the County Administrative Officer and County Council of Fresno last Friday afternoon. And uh, on your uh, example, green printing uh, shows the changes, that recommended changes that we would make uh, that just were missed uh, for the most part in um, the changes made by uh, Mr. Cedarborg uh, last Friday. Um, the, <laughs> the agreement, all the agencies have to agree to the same terms. We have Fresno adopting an agreement. We have um, Kings adopting it, adopting the concept of the JPA. Uh, we have Madera doing this, virtually the same. Uh, no action by Merced at this point. So uh, Mr. Jackson can take you through the um, changes that were recommended by Fresno last ap uh, Friday afternoon and the changes that we recommend. We do have a PowerPoint to uh, walk you through that or you can simply review the document that you have there and ask us questions. We have several options uh, today and, uh, and I'll go through all of them and well then before we'll, you do that okay can, council uh, supervisor Venable, you have it yeah i was just gonna say so we still have to wait for six more attorneys or six more counties to look at this so we're gonna have six more suggested changes because every individual well, attorney is well, worth here, let, let, be, well, let, well sir I, <laughs> I i i would um and not to throw your departing cao under the bus but i will do so well he knows what he's going into so we we actually my office was not involved in this until two okay. weeks ago um what what we have is we have sort of a, a lot of discussions by different staff. Last week, well, on the 22nd of, of uh, September, whenever that was, we sort of uh, took control and started sending out emails to all of okay. my colleagues in the other counties saying, you know, this is where we are, this is where we are, this is where we are. So everybody was getting the same information at exactly the same time. And... Um, We've had some very helpful responses. For example, the County of Fresno has been very responsive, and we've had some people that have been noticeably silent. I can't promise you that someone isn't laying in the weeds and isn't going to blast out at the last minute and say, oh, I want to change to Well, that's great. Language. I'm glad to hear that other counties have collaborated already to get Well, they've been offered the opportunity to okay. collaborate, and they have not stepped forward other than, as I mentioned, um, one way or the other. So I can't promise you that there isn't somebody that has a change that they want to have made. I understand that Merced County's Council made suggestions for changes a while ago to uh, Fresno County Council, and that those have already been incorporated in here. I don't know what they were because I never Council, saw them. Council, if I might interrupt just for a second, I think to kind of get cut to the chase here. Uh, the important thing is that, and to give some context, uh, initially Fresno County took the position uh, based upon a, a joint meeting of, of the various counties that met on a Saturday, not in violation of the Brown Act because there was no more than two members of any board members that were of any board that was there, uh, and came up with a concept that was a nine-member board. And uh, subsequently, in consultation with some of the, some additional stakeholders, it was <coughs> thought that maybe we had, we had not discussed and we did not discuss and, and decline a couple of different positions and we figured that had they been discussed that day they would have been included as well but they were not so Fresno went ahead and adopted what would the, the group that had met on that Saturday said which was a nine-member position Correct. and also that there was an issue about uh, um, how they were going to uh, uh, operate uh, in terms of hiring personnel and so forth and <coughs> then subsequently to that there were actions taken by Madera County and by Kings County to adopt this subsequent position, which is the 11-member board, and to take away and give to the, uh, to the JPA the determination of who they would hire uh, to work for them. Fresno County is in agreement of that, apparently, because as we were up at the San Joaquin Association meeting uh, this last week, uh, John Navaretti, the, exist the, the departing CAO of Fresno County, uh, called us all together, and Fresno apparently was in agreement with that. <coughs> My suggestion is simply this. 
We need to come up with a formalized agreement that all will adopt. I would not want Tulare County to adopt a document today that will probably, before it's all said and done, have some other minor rent revisions to it. However, I think what we should do is adopt the concept position that has been taken by Madera County and Kings County, and because of the good efforts of your office, continue this process of coming up with a finalized written document, which will go back to all of the boards of supervisors to be, uh, to be uh, approved in the near future, hopefully within the next uh, two weeks at the latest. Uh, and if that's an agreement with the rest of my board members, that's, I think, how we should proceed. I agree. And that, that actually would have been my recommendation, sir. I, I hate to see you take an action and then have to amend something and amend something again. Fresno is clearly going to have to amend what they did actually adopt, but they're the only ones that have adopted formal language. And uh, I think between the good offices of the CAOs who are talking to their county councils and to each other and the county councils, we should be able to come up with language that um, at least we can all agree we should submit to our boards. The um, <coughs> additions that are before you, the concept additions, include um, uh, irrigation districts and I believe irrigation districts and tribal members are the two that were added. It's a little hard to remember. Did you want to say something? Yeah. You know, it's pretty simple, okay? You got 11 members, right? Five from the, one from each of the five counties, that's five. Uh, someone from the irrigation district from the east side, irrigation district from the west side, that's seven. Um, wh where this differs a little bit is I thought we were going to pick a city from the east side and a city from the west side. This language doesn't reflect that. Um, but So that's nine. One tribal member is ten, and then an at-large member is eleven. Is that fair, Manuel? Right on. Um, and then the in terms of the contribution from the agencies, that's $50,000 per county to get per things going for participant. And then the last item was, uh, which was the JPA will select the staff. Those, that's really the meat and potatoes of this. And I think one other thing, which fair? is the agreement, it, it is. Yeah. And one last thing I could think of a, it would be that the finances would be go through the, uh, the ca a county auditor's office, so there would be an accountability factor. Are required by law when you create a JBA to identify the, who's going to have that responsibility, the fiscal responsibility, which is in this draft. But I think just the statement that. How about at the Fresno County CEO's office? I'm kidding. Uh, uh, Mr. So Rousseau let, just if, if illustrated part of the problem. There's supposed to be one from the east side and one from the west side. So. Uh, but, but I think it goes back the to the chair's, the chair's point is that we're supporting the concept of it and right. that we are, we are going to be one of those entities that's going to be a part of it. Yes. And I think that this board, uh, that's the question we have in front of us. Right. Really. Yeah, the, the other thing that's important from um, my perspective as your council is, um, given the large number of members, I did not think it was appropriate that you would have to wait for all of these seats to be filled before you could take action as a JPA. So under our version of events, um, once you had the five counties, you could then proceed forward as the JPA and add members as you went forward but for the purpose, for example, discussing with Supervisor Worthley regulations that are coming up and the need to make comments on those regulations, you could make comments as a JPA whether or not you had got the east side and the, the west side, et cetera. Um, and I note in, in uh, this draft, how those people are selected is all to be left up to drafting of the bylaws. It's not within the JPA itself so that we don't wordsmith it to death. Uh, and then once you have a, a, at least a core body, you can decide if you want to do that by lot or in some other fashion um, to get those people quickly serving. So yeah, we're not, I don't case. think we're going to make those decisions here no. today. Are you looking for a motion? We're looking for a motion to accept the concept as is outlined by um, Jean Rousseau and augmented by the issue about the uh, auditor. I'll make that motion, including the, uh, the commitment of $50,000. I have a motion by Supervisor Cox. Second. Second by Supervisor Ashita. Please cast your votes. Well, is there any comment? Oh, uh, any public any comment public on this matter? Oh, we'll hold the votes in abeyance here until we have uh, <laughs> public comment, from at least announcing. Welcome to our chambers. Good morning. Uh, 
Chairman and Supervisors, I, I'm Mario Santoyo, uh, Executive Director for the California Latino Water Coalition and formerly Senior Management for Front Water Authority for a short 29 years. So I know a little bit about water and I know uh, a little bit about the importance of water to Tulare County. Uh, just as a note, 50%, um, 50% 50 50 of all the contracted water from Millerton Lake, which is the federal water, comes to Tulare County. It serves lots of counties, but 50% comes to this county. So it's a big deal for uh, Tulare County to be engaged in this issue. Uh, I can also tell you that over the past 30 years, 15 million acre feet have been lost to the ocean because of the lack of capacity at Millerton. So a lot of water has gone to the ocean, which could have been helpful during these past four dry years. Uh, having said that, I wanna first thank you know, this board who's always been very proactive in supporting whatever it took to advance water reliability for not only this county, but its surrounding counties. Uh, in particular, uh, Ellen Ishida, who has been there, and, and, and Supervisor Worthy, and all of you guys. Uh, so I wanna start off with that. Uh, the formation of the JPA is critical because it's taken us 10 years to one, engage the governor, at that time Schwarzenegger, to do a water bond, to, to eventually get it through legislation in 09, to negotiate it and hammer it until finally in 14, when we put it on the ballot and it successfully passed. But, but the job's not done. The money's there, but to get it, you have to apply for it. And to apply for it, you know, it's gonna take a regional representation of our area to be successful. And so when I say that, and this goes to the amendments, it's gonna be critical that it not be just the counties. The counties are an important part, no doubt. But unless you have some communities, particularly disadvantaged communities as a component to it, if you, and you have to have water agencies as a component to it, and you have to have also tribal councils as a component to it. I've been engaged in Sacramento in stakeholder meetings to know enough that if we're gonna be successful for asking for a billion plus dollars, you have to have a diversified portfolio. And that's why you need that amendment that gives you that opportunity to do so. Um, so I'm going to uh, you know, suggest that you give high uh, consideration towards the concept that was placed by Supervisor Worthy in the sense that we've been working very closely with all the counties and uh, we, we, we kind of helped Madera put its, its paper together that they passed. We were at Kings County uh, last week and they passed it. What you have there in terms of this amendment concept is in essence, you know, let's, let's enhance it from nine to 11 to make sure we have that broader diversity in there. Uh, also, let's, let's let the JPA board uh, make the determination on how it's gonna run its administration and so forth. Uh, in terms of hammering out the words, I, ha I hadn't seen the, the, the red lines until this morning when they, it was mentioned. I was called by John Neveretti, uh, per the instructions of his county, to call me to sit down and negotiate the wordsmithing. Uh, because they've realized that we've brought things to them and it was much better for them to sit down and let's work it out so that everybody gets on the same page. Because you're absolutely right. You don't want to be passing a document that's going to be made changes. But you can move with the concept and that's what I would encourage you to do. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Manuel. Good morning again. Uh, Manuel Cunanese, Farmers League and part of the Latino Water Coalition as well as our agricultural groups in the Valley. Again, I wanna thank this board, the comments, uh, through so your hard work and efforts and understanding the complexities. And, but we are under extreme timeline, as we all know. The commissioners that were appointed by the governor under Arnold and under Brown um, are going to, their last workshop of hearing all testimony for the state is the 22nd of October, which is in a few days. And then they're gonna start putting together the language for the guidelines. And for the JPA, we'll bring in irrigation districts, cities, and storage of everybody putting together a document. Rather than just being a little storage document, it ain't gonna get any footage in Sacramento. But when you bring in east-west side cities, disadvantaged communities, they're gonna bring their projects in irrigation and tribal. That project now goes to this volume, but it meets to the discussion of the commissioners. 
and those funds. And the second partner of this whole JPA is the Bureau. The Bureau has sat down with us. They are happy now that we're going to go forward because we all worked hard for this money. And they were disappointed. Many folks said, what's going to happen? We're going to lose all this money. It's going to go to Los Angeles or San Francisco. So your efforts, green and red, and I think with um, Mario's right that uh, John and Mr. Russo, you yourself, are going to get this thing finalized. In my discussions, even with some of you and others, it looks like we have come to an agreement, but it has to have the commitment of the city's irrigation district must be a part of this board as an acting board, because if not, and it's only the counties, I know what the folks are going to do at the Bureau, and I know what they're going to do in Sacramento. So the fastest we work, as you are doing a great job on this, and then let those cities start picking out how they want to select their, their representative from east and west, and the irrigation. If we don't have an irrigation agency, I'm not even qualified. I don't think anybody in here is qualified to figure out what happens at Friant or Millerton or any of these dams because of the complexity. So, again, I want to thank uh, Mr. Wortley and all of you supervisors for all the, the work that you've done over the last several weeks when we finally got attended of this thing in June. We were contacted, Mario and I, and to get on it or we're going to lose it. So the only way was to do and follow um, the temp, uh, uh, site's JPA, and they've been at it four years now. So we took theirs, that's already a solid issue, and that the federal government and our United States senators and some others saying, okay, now you've got something going, now we see it's solid, so now you're eligible maybe even for the Federal Bureau to be a big partner rather than just a little partner. So, again, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else wishing to address this on this matter? Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. <laughs> Morning, gentlemen. Supervisors, my name is Victor Lopez. I am the mayor of the city of Orange Cove, and I'm here to support you folks. Let's do it. Let's do it for our children, our grandchildren. Let's do it for the food basket of the world. You know, we are the food basket of the world, and we've been working you folks for 10 years. Let's make a touchdown. I leave it in your hands. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Very good. Votes have been cast, and uh, because of your great uh, arguments, there was a unanimous uh, four to uh, nothing. Uh, Supervisor Ennis being absent to support the concept, and we will work diligently to come up with a finalized document with our colleagues in the uh, other counties and the other agencies. Mr. Chairman, if I might suggest then, your board could vote to continue this matter to next uh, week. That'd be so great. That we, so that we have it already as an agenda item. Um, You've adopted the concept, and if you, we just add possible adoption of language, that allows us to uh, hopefully not wordsmith too much. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'd amend my motion to uh, continue this item also to next meeting. That's acceptable. That's yeah, acceptable to me. Okay, well then we will again vote. Uh, please cast your ballot. Votes are unanimous, four to zero. Again, then supervisor is being absent. Very well. Thank you for all being here today. That concludes our general uh, meeting. We will have closed session items, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, council. I, I think Madam Council. Excuse me. Thank you. I thought I was promoted. Uh, we, have, we have items A through D on your board's closed session agenda. I do anticipate announcement. Thank you. Announcement out of closed session today, October 6, 2015, by Kathleen Bales Lane, County Council, in the matter of item C on the board's closed session agenda, uh, public employee appointment. The board voted to appoint an interim CAO. Uh, they voted to appoint Michael C. Spada in an amount uh, to be compensated in an amount 10% over his existing compensation. And I'm going back into close. Oh, I'm so sorry. Motion in second. That's what you need. Uh, I have that. Motion of Supervisor Ishida, seconded by Supervisor Vanderpool. 
four, uh, zero vote, Supervisor Ennis being absent. And then we still have the um, safety thing. 